What's up my pre -cut people? Michael Princhak here. In this video, we're gonna talk about 1.11 equivalent representations of polynomial and rational functions. Now, this particular topic, in my opinion, has three kind of big parts to it. The first part is simply reminding you about standard form versus factored form. Now, the standard form of a polynomial or a rational function gives us some really good insight into the end behavior of that function. For example, we could look at this polynomial, f of x equals negative 4x cubed minus 20x squared plus 56x, and we could look at the degree being odd and the leading coefficient being negative, and that tells us that we know that the right end behavior is going towards negative infinity and the left end behavior is going towards positive infinity. So again, all of those information that we learned way back in topic 1.6 about end behavior polynomials, again, just re really kind of reminding you that that is what we see when we're in standard form. And even the standard form of a rational function we see here g of x is that's when we tell us that all right well if we divide our leading terms and the division of those leading terms the outcome of that division is going to tell us about the end behavior in this particular case when we divide those leading terms we just get x that's a polynomial function that's a positive leading coefficient in an odd degree that tells us that the right end behavior is going towards infinity and the left end behavior is going towards negative infinity so again all we're reminding you here is that the standard form of a polynomial or rational function really gives us a lot of information about the end behavior of that function Whereas factored form of a rational or a polynomial function gives us a lot of information about zeros, vertical asymptotes, holes, and even information about domain and range. In these two examples here, well, these are actually the factored form of the previous functions we just looked at. So when the polynomial f of x is in factored form, it's really easy for us to see that there are three zeros at zero, two, and negative seven. And when it comes to this rational function g of x, it's really easy for us to see that there are two zeros, three and five, a vertical asymptote at x equals two, and that there are no holes. Again, awesome for us to see these things when we are in factored form. So the first part of topic 1.11 is just really reminding you about the two different representations of polynomial and rational functions and how those different representations tell us, well, different things. And the second part of this topic focuses on long division, polynomial long division. Now I might be like, why do we need polynomial long division right now? Well, it serves kind of two big purposes. First, polynomial division does allow us to understand factors of polynomial functions. Just like when we divide two numbers, if you divide eight by four, you get two. The fact that you get no remainder when you do that division tells you that four is a factor of eight. The same thing kind of works out when you're dividing polynomials. If you divide a polynomial by another polynomial and you get no remainder, it means your divisor is a factor of the original polynomial in the numerator. So again, it really is very useful for us to understand polynomial long division because it helps us find factors of polynomial functions. But to be quite honest, in this particular moment of our unit, the best thing that polynomial long division helps us with is find slant asymptotes. When you know that you have a slant asymptote, and let's quickly remind you how you know that. When you study the end behavior of a rational function, which means you first divide those leading terms, and if you get a polynomial function that's linear, so the outcome of dividing those leading terms in the process of trying to find the end behavior, the outcome is a polynomial linear function, well, that instantly tells you that you are gonna have a slant asymptote. Now, to find that slant asymptote, you actually have to divide. You have to take the function in the numerator and divide it by the function in the denominator. And the quotient of that long division that you're gonna do is the equation of the slant asymptote. Awesome, great. But we probably shouldn't talk too much about slant asymptotes until we first know how to do polynomial long division. Now, polynomial long division is an algebraic process similar to numerical long division involving a quotient and a remainder. If the polynomial f of x is divided by the polynomial g of x, then f of x can be written as g of x times q of x, that's the quotient of the long division, plus the remainder of x. All right, pretty easy to do. So again, all we're doing is taking a function f and dividing by a function g of x. And when we do that, we're gonna get a quotient q of x and remainder r of x. And that allows us to rewrite the function f of x. Now, alternatively, the original quotient between f of x and g of x can be expressed as f of x divided by g of x equals the quotient of x 
plus the remainder of x divided by g of x. All I did was take that previous equation and divide everything by g of x, and that's what creates this alternative form. It's again, it's a way that we could take the actual uh, division problem f of x divided by g of x and rewrite it as the quotient plus the remainder divided by g of x. Now, additionally, as I've already mentioned, if the remainder is zero, then g of x must be a factor of f of x because that means that g of x went into f of x with no remainder, which means that it must be a factor. That means that q of x times g of x is directly equal to f of x, again, with no remainder. Now, as I already mentioned, the primary reason why we are doing polynomial long division right now is because it's very helpful in finding equations of slant asymptotes for graphs of rational functions. The result of polynomial long division is going to be the slant asymptote. But again, I have to emphasize one more time, you first have to make sure that you even have a slant asymptote. And again, that all starts with identifying the end behavior. When you divide your first leading term, the leading term of the numerator divided by the leading term of the denominator, and you get a polynomial function that's linear, that's where you know you have a slant asymptote. So you can proceed with the long division to actually find the equation of the slant asymptote. And the quotient of that division is your slant asymptote. Doesn't matter what the remainder is, the remainder is actually not used at all in the slant asymptote equation. I mean, the remainder is important, but it's not important when it comes to finding the equation of that slant asymptote because the quotient is that equation. All right, let's look at some examples first of just using polynomial long division. I hope you kind of already know how to do it, but we're going to remind you. And then we'll look at some examples where we're actually going to use the polynomial long division to identify the slant asymptote of a rational function. All right, here come those examples. So in this first example here, we're asked to take the function f of x and divide it by the function g of x. So the first thing we have to do is write it as long division, you know, old school long division. So the dividend, the value that's getting divided, is going to go inside of our little bar there. So we have the 3x cubed plus 5x squared plus 8x plus 7 inside. And then the divisor, what we're dividing by, in this case g of x, that goes on the outside. Now the process is very simple, but I like to go really, really slow because it's so easy to mess this up. So we start off with saying, how can I turn a 3x into a 3x cubed? What do I need to multiply by? Well, I need to multiply by a 1x squared. So I'm going to put that 1x squared in the x squared column. Then I'm going to multiply 3x times 1x squared is 3x cubed. And then don't forget the 2 as well. 2 times 1x squared is a 2x squared. Okay, now the next part is the most important part that a lot of kids actually mess up. We have to subtract. If you remember old school long division, you subtract. So 3x cubed minus 3x cubed is 0. 5x squared minus 2x squared is 3x squared. And then the process repeats itself all over again. How do I turn a 3x into a 3x squared? I'm going to multiply it by 1x. 3x times 1x is 3x squared. 2 times 1x is 2x. And then once again, don't forget to subtract. 3x squared minus 3x squared is 0. 8x minus 2x is 6x. And then start all over again. How do I turn a 3x into a 6x? Well, we simply multiply by 2. 2 times 3x is 6x. 2 times 2 is 4. And as always, we subtract. 6 minus 6x minus 6x is 0. 7 minus 4, don't forget that 7 up there. 7 minus 4 is 3. Now at this point, 3x cannot be multiplied to turn into a 3. So the 3 is our remainder. We're at the end of our line. So our quotient, q of x, is equal to 1x squared plus 1x plus 2. Obviously, don't need those ones if you don't want to. And our remainder, r of x, is equal to 3. So once again, I can now write f of x, the original function, as r of x, 3x plus 2. Or excuse me, g of x. That was the divisor, I'm sorry. Multiplied by the quotient, x squared plus x plus 2, plus the remainder of 3. Nice and simple. Pretty easy. All right, in this next example, we're going to take function f and once again divide it by function g. So the first thing we have to do is write this as long division. But something really important is going to happen in this problem. 
we skipped a couple terms in our dividend. The dividend was 2x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 2. We have to have placeholders for every single degree. So we have our fourth degree, our third degree. Then we need a 0x squared because there were no x squareds, a 0x because there were no x's, and then our minus 2. But we have to have those placeholders or else we're going to get kind of messed up. And then the divisor, g of x, 2x squared plus x plus 1 goes on the outside. And then the whole process starts over again. I think it's kind of fun. All right, how do I turn a 2x squared into a 2x to the fourth? We're going to multiply by x squared. 2x squared times x squared is 2x to the fourth. x times x squared is x cubed. And 1 times x squared is 1x squared. And again, here is the most important part. And actually, this is the type of problem a lot of kids mess up on, is making sure you subtract. Be very deliberate with this. 2 minus 2 is 0x to the fourth. Negative 1x cubed minus x cubed is negative 2x cubed. If you need to go to the side and do some dirty work and write that out, that's a negative 1 minus a 1. Negative 1 minus 1 is going to be the negative 2x cubed. 0 minus x squared is a negative x squared. And then again, the whole process starts all over again. Now to turn a 2x squared into a negative 2x cubed, we need a negative x that way, 2x squared times negative x makes negative 2x cubed. x times negative x makes negative x squared. And 1 times negative x makes negative 1. x. Negative 1x. And then, of course, we're going to subtract everything. Be very careful. Negative 2x cubed minus negative 2x cubed. Again, write that down if you need to. Negative 2 minus negative 2. That's going to turn into negative 2 plus 2, which is going to make a 0x cubed. Negative 1 minus negative 1. Once again, negative 1 minus negative 1. x squared is going to turn into 0x squared. And then 0x minus negative 1x. 0 minus negative 1 is actually going to turn into a positive 1x. Now, at this point, we're at the end of the line because we cannot turn a 2x squared into a 1x. So all we're going to do now is stop. We have our quotient. Our quotient Q of X is X squared minus X. And our remainder R of X is just X. Okay, not too bad. All right, let's do another example here as well. Once again, taking F of X divided by G of X. Now, I'm actually going to do this similar problem twice to kind of prove something to you here. All right, so once again, the dividend on top, the 3X squared plus 7X minus 20 goes inside. The divisor X minus 2 goes on the inside. And how do I turn an X into a 3X squared? I need a 3X x times 3x is 3x squared. Negative 2 times 3x is negative 6x. And as always, don't forget to subtract. 3 minus 3 is 0x squared. 7 minus negative 6. Write that down if you need to. I, you'll, I do it. It helps me see that I'm going to get a 13x minus 20. All right, now, again, how do I turn x into a 13x? I need a 13. x times 13x is 13x. Negative 2 times 13 is negative 26. And then I'm going to subtract 13x minus 13x is 0. Negative 20 minus negative 26. Again, write that down if you need to. Negative 20 minus negative 26. That's going to turn into a positive 6. So a positive 6x there if you do that math right. And how do I turn an x into a 6? Oh, wait well, a minute. There was no x on that. Oh, I'm so sorry. It was just 6. Okay, I'm an idiot. All right, so now I'm at the end of the line. I cannot turn an x into a 6. So my quotient, my q of x, is 3x plus 13. And my, remain, my remainder, r of x, equals 6. Now I want to remind you, because we got a remainder of 6, the fact that we had a remainder, that means that x minus 2 is not a factor of the original function. So x minus 2 is not a factor of 3x squared plus 7x minus 20. Because if you are a factor, you go into it evenly with no remainder. And now we're going to look at a very similar problem where, guess what? That's actually going to happen. So here we're taking that same original function, but this time we're dividing by x plus 4. So once again, write out the long division. How do you turn an x into a 3x squared? We're going to need to multiply by a 3x. x times 3x is 3x squared. 4 times 3x is 12x. And then we're going to subtract. 3x squared minus 3x squared is 0. 7 minus negative 12. 7 minus minus I'm sorry, 7 minus 12. It's not negative 12. 7, 7 minus 12 is negative 5x. And then how do I turn an x into a negative 5x? I'm going to multiply by negative 5. x times 3, excuse me, x times negative 5. I'm getting confused here. x times negative 5 is negative 5x. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. And I get a subtraction here. So negative 5 minus negative 5 is 0x. 
Negative 20 minus negative 20 is zero as well. So I'm getting a remainder of zeros. So again, this is what I was trying to point out earlier. The quotient is 3x minus 5. And because my remainder is zero, that tells me that x plus 4 is a factor of 3x squared plus 7x minus 20. And the quotient is the other factor only when you get a remainder of zero, which means that my original function is going to be equal to x plus 4 times 3x minus 5 with no remainder, which means that x plus 4 and 3x minus 5 are factors. So long division is actually another way that you can find factors. Um, most kids aren't going to do it that way, but it does work. All right, now let's actually focus into, I don't want to say the main point of topic 1.11, but this is actually what connects it with rational functions. When we do long division, we could find a slant asymptote. But we first have to make sure we know we have a slant asymptote because long division could be used with any polynomials, not just to find slant asymptotes. So we first have to make sure we have a slant asymptote. And to do that, remember, we're going to divide our leading terms. And when we divide our leading terms, we just get 2. X, okay? Now, that is a linear polynomial. Because it's a linear polynomial, that tells us we have a slant asymptote. And our end behavior is going to mirror that linear polynomial. Now, I know I'm kind of reviewing some older stuff there, but the idea is when you divide your leading terms and you get something linear, a linear polynomial, that's a sign you have a slant asymptote. So to find that slant asymptote, I actually have to go ahead and do the division. So I'm going to put that 2x squared minus 5x minus 12 inside, put the x minus 5 on the outside, and get to work. How do I turn an x into a 2x squared? Multiply it by 2x. x times 2x is 2x squared. Negative 5 times 2x is negative 10x. And then I'm going to go ahead and subtract. 2x squared minus 2x squared is 0. Negative 5 minus negative 10 is going to turn into a positive 5x. And then start over again. How do I turn x into a 5x? I'm going to multiply by 5. x times 5 is 5x. Negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. And don't forget to subtract again. 5x minus 5x is 0. Negative 12 minus negative 25. Be very, very careful. It's going to be a positive 13. Now, that's my remainder, right? I I'm stopped. I'm at the end of the line. I can't do anything else. Now, again, this is important to hear. The quotient is your slant asymptote. Regardless of what the remainder is, the remainder has nothing to do with the slant asymptote. It's obviously an important value in terms of long division, but just the quotient is the equation of my slant asymptote. So my slant asymptote for this rational function is 2x plus 5. Overall, not too bad. Let's do one more. Here is another rational function. And at first, before I start looking for a slant asymptote, I should probably make sure I have one. So we're going to divide our leading terms. When you divide your leading terms, you just get x. Well, guess what? x is a linear polynomial. And when you get that linear polynomial, when you divide your leading terms, that's a sign you have a slant asymptote, no horizontal asymptote. All right, so this is one of those problems where we do have to have a placeholder again because we have the x squared and we have no x's. So I got to put a spot for that. And then, of course, the minus 16 with the x plus 3 on the outside. How do I turn an x into an x squared? I just need a 1x. x times x is x squared. 3 times x is 3x. And then don't forget to subtract. x squared minus x squared is 0. 0 minus 3x is negative 3x. How do I turn an x into a negative 3x? Multiply by negative 3. And I get negative 3x. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. Subtract. Negative 3x minus negative 3x is 0. Negative 16 minus negative 9 is going to turn into a plus 9. So that's going to be a negative 7. But that's my remainder. The remainder does not matter for the slant asymptote. So the equation of my slant asymptote for this rational function is y equals x minus 3. All right, so hopefully that was a quick little rundown of how to do long division with some, some more sophisticated problems. But then how do we actually use long division to get that slant asymptote? Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, there is a third part to topic 1.11 out of AP Precalculus, and that is covering binomial expansion, expanding binomials. Now, I don't want to do that in this video because it's going to take a little bit too much time. This video will get a little bit long. So I have a whole separate video that covers just how to do that binomial expansion. So please check it out. All right, that's it for topic 1.11. Hope you understand polynomial long division. And again, the primary goal of it right now is to use it to help us find slight asymptotes for rational functions.